two of the three candidates for counselor at large are here. Uh, the third candidate, Anthony Patillo, was contacted twice and invited to attend and both times declined the invitation. So I just want to be clear that we did extend the hand and it was his decision not to participate. But we're very happy to have Jesse Adams and Bill Dwight uh, with us. And uh, uh, I feel like, you know, stick them on the Barbie and let's grill them, huh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're going to start off. Each gets a two-minute introductory statement. So uh, doing this alphabetically, we'll start with Jesse. I'm Jesse Adams. I live on Main Street. I'm an attorney with a law office also on Main Street. I'm an at-large city councilor and the city council vice president. I have been honored to serve in the council for the past four years and would like the opportunity to continue to do so. When I ran four years ago, I talked about the things that I thought were important, things like openness in government, responsiveness, and fiscal oversight. I am here tonight to discuss the issues that impact your lives and to ask for one of your two votes for city councilor at large. I was one who led the charge for the much needed new city charter that passed overwhelmingly last November, which has led to better overall government. I've rewritten the city council rules and the entire committee system in an effort to make the council more efficient and to provide better oversight of government functions. I drafted an ordinance that requires every decision-making body to have an open public comment period at the beginning of each meeting. My law now assures that every citizen has a right to be heard and speak to the issues that affect them before important decisions are made and to step forward for open, accessible government and best practices. I drafted a public art ordinance which will mandate greater public participation and oversight of public art, and I believe it will lead to high quality public art in this city. Also last month was the third annual Northampton Jazz Festival, which I am a co-founder and board member. I've supported changes in zoning that allow property owners to have more flexibility with their property and allow for more affordable housing units. I sponsored a key amendment that along with an amendment from the current Ward 3 Councilor created additional requirements for larger developments that will safeguard neighborhoods and allow them to keep their character while fostering new growth to expand our tax base and bring in new much needed revenue. My zoning amendment came from the concerns of residents based primarily in Ward 3. I listened to you, I heard you and I acted and my amendment protects you. I got it done. If re-elected I will continue with my hard work and I will, get, I will get results for you. Uh, Mr. Dwight? Um, I'm Bill Dwight. I'm uh, city councilor at large. Um, and, and actually, let me, let me start over. I want to thank you, Jerry, and, and thank the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, which, of course, um, I should point out, this is the only forum in which uh, uh, Councilor Adams and I even get to talk. And, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do that, even though the first pitch of the World Series is being thrown right now. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Que sera, sera. I am Bill Dwight. I am the city council president because uh, my colleagues were kind enough to um, sign me up for that. Now, at first, when I actually was chosen city council president, I did it with marked reluctance um, and have since come to really appreciate it, in large part due to the fact as Councilor Adams uh, talked about, the, the charter reform that was put into place. And that actually is going to speak in large part to my reasons for wanting to continue to serve and why I think the, uh, my position so far has had some value. It's inclusion. And it is a distinct demarcation of the division of powers. And as council president, I became, uh, I very much appreciated the process of deliberation and the development of polity that we participated in. And it was a learning process that I'm very proud to have experienced. I want to continue in that respect because I think when we talk about public service, we frequently forget the public part. And that is, we usually talk in terms of you and us. And I would much prefer, and I think we're moving in the direction of speaking about we we collectively, how we participate, and how we contribute to our own destinies. And I would like to continue to facilitate that process, and I hope that you'll consider giving me one of your two votes come November 5th. Thank you. Okay, first question, we'll start with uh, Councilor Dwight. Over the past few days, I've spoken with a number of residents who have expressed surprise and some concern about what seems to be dissension within the Northampton Police Department. In your opinion, 
are there problems in that department that need attention? And if so, what do you think needs to be done to rectify them? Well, I mean, uh, once again, this goes back to the charter. And, and Councilor Adams and Councilor Freeman Daniels and I have had a number of discussions about this. The Division of Powers, of course, puts the executive in charge of departmental issues in large part. The, the influence that we bring to bear is that we are just as you are. We're citizens. We don't have authority over the police department, although we certainly do have influence at contract time. We have influence at budgetary time. That said, it doesn't mean that we're excused from being concerned. I am right now, given the way this is broken out, which I have to say I'm kind of disappointed the way it's proceeded, but <coughs> all things being equal, I would much prefer to see that we allow the process to go forward with an investigation that's being conducted by the, the district attorney in the Hamden County and then proceed if there are policy violations within the within uh, the police department that those be addressed by the city's HR, the human resources department, and by the police chief. It is a professional organization and well run by my reckoning. And I think I honestly, without you know, this uh, you would expect this from a politician talking about the city. I do honestly believe that we have one of the finest police departments you're going to find anywhere. And I think that you'll you'll see this kind of discord in virtually every department, um, in any business or enterprise anyone's ever been associated with probably experienced some level of this. But if, if it's reached the threshold of policy violation and reached the threshold of a crime, then there's a different, then there's a different way to address that. And I, I have every confidence that we will. Councilor Adams? I'm the chair of public safety and um, I take this matter very seriously. And I don't believe for one second that the quality of service will be affected while this matter gets resolved. Um, and I also respect very much labor in general. Um, but I also do agree that there is an investigation underway with a district attorney from Hannon County. And we need to see what comes of that before um, we can really know what will happen. And I also believe that um, I do believe the mayor will handle the situation effectively. And the reason why I say that is because um, the mayor has dealt with other departments who have had issues appropriately. I'm referring to um, specifically the parking department. Uh, and there were some issues there a few years ago and the mayor dealt with it effectively and decisively. So um, I have the faith in the mayor that he will deal with it appropriately. And I do agree with the council president that if there are policy violations, uh, and of course, if there are crimes, that they need to be dealt with appropriately as well. Okay, second question. And uh, Council Adams will let you start. Uh, should Smith Vocational High School merge with the Northampton Public School System? Please indicate yes or no and why. Well, I, I believe that one of the things we need to do as a government is look to um, regionalization and combining services um, with other entities, other areas, other communities. And similarly with this situation, um, I, I, I will consider it. But here's what I want to consider. I support merging services only when there is no um, noticeable decline in services after the merger. And I support services that save taxpayer money. Certainly the proposal will save taxpayer money. So in order to convince me that it is a good idea, I will need to be demonstrated very clearly and by a pretty high standard that the that any proposed merger will not affect the quality and level of education because it really is all about the students. Thank you. It is indeed a unique asset and and in fact woefully underappreciated in the community. And to uh, Den Wolf's point, I, I actually agree with virtually everything he said with one exception. He said the mayor wants to get his money back. It's not the mayor's money, it's our money. And in, the mayor is charged with presiding over that money. The discussion, I'm glad, is engaged. I'm glad we're actually talking about this for two reasons. One, it actually raises the profile of Smith Vocational. You see that actually people are talking about it and having more attention and paying more attention to it. But more importantly, it's a fiscal issue. It is a fiscal issue. When you get down to it, uh, we are unique, as everyone continued to point out, with two uh, school districts in the community. It is a trust. It is unique in every feature. And that's very much to the good, by and large. But with redundancy of some services, it needs to be addressed or at least understood. 
when you have replications of, of uh, finance oversight, when you have replication of human resource development and things of that nature, it is not inappropriate to discuss that. And at the same time, just as Councilor Adams said, and I don't think, and I don't think there's a single person who would, who would disagree with this premise, that we need to sustain and help promote the expansion and amplification of Smith Vocational to our credit, to the community's credit. But at the same time, we can't do it and pretend it doesn't exist, that it doesn't have a potential dilatorious impact on our own larger school system and our own larger budget, which is 53% of the budget goes to schools in this community. So I'm really actually anxious to see an expanded conversation and discussion and taking in and reviewing what it is, what Smith Vocational means to us and point and what we in turn mean back to Smith Vocational. Okay. Um, one of the byproducts or perhaps unintended consequences of Northampton's recent development is the apparent inability of many long-term residents to continue to afford living here. Do you see this as a problem and what would you propose the city do to help stop this outflow? Um, I'm, I'm next. It, yeah, it is a problem. I mean, it is a problem and it's a problem actually that's borne by success in some level. The part of the <laughs> part of the appeal of Northampton is well, I mean that's part of that's the problem. The appeal of Northampton, which is very high. Consequently, there's a desire to move here. Many people chose to live here, which is unique to a lot of communities. I've lived in and grown up in some communities. That's not the choice. Most people are looking for a way out. Many people are looking for a way to get in and or stay. And consequently, it creates this competitive push that literally does impact people who've devoted their entire lives to this community and suddenly have to take stock and look and see if they can actually afford to continue to live here, while at the same time living in an asset that's been established by, the by other people valuing their homes. And part, part of this goes to what Ryan mentioned, which is not something that's just limited here, but it's the development of, progr of a progressive tax system that taxes you based on your wealth and, not, and on your ability to pay and not how someone values your property. We in the state have abdicated from uh, collecting money from people, from corporations and from wealthy people, talking about cutting the income tax and it's, all the services are still needed. They're all still the demand. And it's been deferred to towns and municipalities to make up the difference with property taxes, which is a regressive tax. It's not based on your ability to pay. And it threatens the lives and livelihood of, of people that we need to be part of this community because they contribute to this community. And we could be next. And when I say we, I'm very close to next of being priced out of the city of Northampton. And we, I, I know that the council is committed to making sure that doesn't happen. Affordability is, in my opinion, the biggest issue in the city. What we can do about it is two things. We need to create new revenues that are not based um, solely on residential taxes. And we need to look for savings to make the cost of, of running our government um, less expensive. In expanding the tax base, we need to do that both residentially and commercially. I've supported, um, I've supported zoning laws, for example, that, are, that have successfully brought in new businesses. Um, also, a couple other things we can do to that effect. We can lobby the state to see if it's possible for us to keep more of our meals tax money right back here at home. Also, we can turn our landfill into a solar facility, facility making uh, money and generating money from that. As far as looking for savings, energy efficiencies are a great way to save. Energy efficiencies are socially responsible and they save taxpayers money. For example, ESCOs. We hire private companies to come in and find savings um, and then they get paid from those savings. And another thing is I, I already addressed regionalization and, and combining, um, combining our resources with other municipalities and communities, but again, only if that, in combining those services, we put out the same good services and, um, and <clears throat> we can save money and maintain the same level of service in that way. Uh, question from the audience? 
Fred? Uh, Fred Zimnock, Ward 3, and uh, I've been following the uh, Stormwater uh, Enterprise Fund. And uh, in the process of doing that, <clears throat> I said, well, we have two enterprise funds, water and sewer. So um, if you go to the assessor's office, the rates from 1997 to present for water and sewer are listed on a wall. If you look carefully at those numbers, uh, they increase about 6 or 7% per year. Uh, so then my mind went to the Stormwater Enterprise Fund. <coughs> my understanding in that case, the rates will be uh, approved by the city council. And my question is, how is the city council going to vet those rates? How are you going to inspect them to make sure that the rates aren't too high? Uh, I, 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 just here. Okay. Uh, I, uh, Fred, I've been working very hard on this issue, and you, you and I have actually discussed the matter. To answer your question specifically, the Board of Public Works is going to present to us before they ask us to vote on the rate exactly why the, what the rate is, why it's that way, and what the money will be going to. But also to address your concerns about um, how can we contain this from being like the water and sewer rate, this is how. Uh, two ways, really. One thing is that I have drafted an amendment that I have presented already, and it's out there for consideration. Actually, I showed it to you, and then that's to create a permanent cap on it. The current legislation has a temporary cap for five years. My uh, amendment that I've already drafted and proposed has a cap permanently. That's what I'm proposing, and that's how we're going to protect the residents, if it passes, from it being like the water and sewer rates, from having those rates go up exponentially, as you've seen on that wall. I was concerned about that from, from the moment I heard about this, and I've acted on it. Uh, another way that it's, it's important to also know that this is not similar to the, I done? It's, it's, it's not similar to the um, water and sewer rates because it, this has an exemption for people who are um, doing poorly financially, and that's extremely important and, and makes it more fair and more equitable. So I'm proposing a cap to prevent it from being like the water and sewer fees. And I'm working very hard on this issue, and we're also working to ensure that there's as much public process as, as possible on it. And the council president has worked with us, too, as well on this. And, um, and those are the ways that we're going we're gonna to safeguard the ratepayers from this fee getting out of control. And I, I would add to that, since we're going to tag team on this, I think, um, there is also a built-in. Now, this is a unique fee and an important fact. Actually, this is part of my frustration, because with Proposition 2 and a half, as we continue to abdicate funding things through taxation. We came up with alternatives and came up with enterprise funds that are fee devoted. And the bad, the downside to that, of course, is, and you mentioned this as well, is the fact that there is the representation, the distance from representation is much bigger. You have an appointed board that has oversight. We are pushing and we have been pushing. And in fact, this is unique in many respects. Uh, we have Pulled, we have pulled the sense of the Board of Public Works out in the public, and we've had as much authority of, uh, on this issue as we can have at this point constitutionally, and we'll probably hopefully go further. The other issue is one of the things that one of the savings would be uh, mitigation fees. If you are able to address the runoff on your property, that you can offset uh, your 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 charges. One of the frustrating things with this, Fred, as you know, is that water and sewer, you can actually calculate what it is you're contributing or taking from the system. This is a charge for being rained on. But point in fact is the real, but the real pressure comes from the fact there is no other way, at least so far that we can see, to subsidize to our, our, the system that we have put in place to protect ourselves from flooding and from water damage. So we are, actually I'm quite pleased with the level of discussion that we're having and that we will continue to have on this one particular enterprise fund, which, as I said, is unique. It's not, it didn't happen with the storm, it didn't happen with sewage, and it didn't happen with water. It is now happening with this. Thank you. This is a question that was submitted by Mr. Zimnak to me before the... So, so he's monopolizing all the questions. He's <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. For the it. mayor is creating an elected official compensation advisory board. The new body is tasked with studying quote, the adequacy and equity of compensation, benefits, and expense allowances of municipal elected officials and report its findings and recommendations to the mayor and city council, end of quote. 
what is the current compensation, benefits, and expense allowances for city councilor? As city councilors, what do you think would be fair in the future? Well, first of all, it's the mayor is doing this by charge of charter. Just it's not this is something that the mayor just sort of randomly decided to do. Um, and this is always, <laughs> you know, how much do you think you're worth if you're working as a counselor? I, for one, have always advocated uh, that we should be paid a very small stipend. The, the reason being this should hardly be a position that people want to retain because it's paying them well. So far, rock solid success on that. <laughs> but the, the fact is, is that it's been at $5,000 a year. This uh, councils make $5,000 a year. I get a $500 bump as council president, which has kept me in salads. The, 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 uh, that is our annual stipend. Um, when I was an hourly wage earner, it was a net loss for me. Because actually, I, when I'd have to take time off from work, I lost pay. And I never cried poor because of this. I think I would defer to the committee because I don't think that I would offer a, a, a good perspective on that issue. I, but I think I personally would love to see a sliding scale because part of the problem is, is that the only people who can run for office are people who can afford to be in office. We aren't going to get a single mother who is working two jobs to be able to run for office. We're, not, we're only going to hear from her from the outside. We're not going to hear from her on the inside. That's frustrating. Um, you, consequently, you get a lot of people who tend to run for office who are, don't have jobs, who are, who are retired, and that shouldn't be either. So, and we do get insurance. So that, I, by the way, I should have mentioned that as part of our part of our package, we have access to health insurance, which can come out to in, for, in some cases close to twenty thousand um, so, dollars. And that's unfortunately not fair because counselors who don't take that package are not compensated as a result. So, it's, I'm I'm grateful for the the existence of that committee and will abide by their choice. Um, I, Five thousand dollars. I would likely defer to the committee, but frankly, um, I wouldn't. I would hope that it wouldn't be raised much, if at all. And the reason why is because it's not because we don't do a lot of work. We do a tremendous amount of work, from correspondences with the people that we represent to actual meetings, to drafting legislation, to um, you know, you name it. We, we're going to events. Uh, we we put a tremendous amount of time into this. Each and every counselor puts a tremendous amount of time into this, but I would rather see other departments get raises before us. I'd rather see teachers and, and, and public safety and, and all other departments get raises before us because I do believe that we do it because it's, it's almost volunteer work, not quite. We get 5,000, that's not nothing, but, but when you think about the amount of effort and work we put into it, it seems like it's volunteer, but at the same time, I think that if anybody should get a raise, we should be the last ones to get one. Question from the audience? Back row. Uh, Jason Foster, running for City Council for Ward 2. Both of you have expressed concern for the um, increased expenses in the city of Northampton and how you may be pricing yourself out of the market in terms of affordability. What revenue generating ideas do you have that are not tax dependent or the hope of more state aid to help our city generate income? Um. Uh, point of clarification, Jason, you mean revenue generation by the city that would bring in money into the coffers beyond taxation, fines, and fees? Yes. We are constitutionally precluded from doing, engaging in any enterprise that would do that. Part of the problem, part of our frustration, of course, is the fact that constitutionally we're precluded from running a deficit and a debt. State's not so encumbered. Certainly the national government isn't. The, we, um, at the same time, we are very limited in how we generate revenue. That's why you often hear people talk about growth, because growth basically means tax generation. But blind growth is not an asset sometimes. It actually has a dilatorious impact on the community and its ability to function. That is the frustration of a councillor and of a mayor and of every municipal system. Because this is the point, all the dysfunction you see in DC is a, is a product of politicking. 
And where the governance happens is right at this very level, and this is part of our frustration. This is where it happens. We're the most elemental form of governance. And we are handcuffed and constrained any number of ways with growing commitment, uh, lessening commitments from the state, growing fixed costs, and at the same time trying to, what we're trying to do is tap a very limited resource, which is the community. And so I would love the opportunity and the means to generate money beyond, you know, neighborhood groups raising money to buy pens for schools. I would love to, you know, convert something into a Ferris wheel and make money for the city. But we can't. We're not allowed to. And that is our eternal frustration. As I've stated before, I think one of the things we need to do is continue to expand the tax base so that we have new people and entities paying in, both residentially and commercially. And right now, fortunately, there's an awful lot of commercial activity going on uh, in our city. And that's one thing we need to con continue to do. Um, I, I've su I support all of that effort. Um, payment in lieu of taxes. We need to go to the nonprofits who, by Massachusetts general laws, don't pay taxes, or some may pay in a little bit, but none are manda ma mandated to do so, and create a program where, where we go to them and request that they contribute more because they don't have to pay taxes. And there are other good models out there. A lot of other communities have done it. Um, I have actually sat down with the mayor and another citizen who believed in this sort of initiative and asked if we can get going on this sort of program. With Smith, they do have a small pilot program, but um, I asked the mayor if we could do a, a, a request, sit down with them and see if they'd be willing to do a larger one. And I know he wants to, I believe he wants to wait till the, the new president is in, now the new president's in, so I'm expecting that to go forward and I'll continue to work towards that as I have been. Um, also, I, as I stated earlier, Another way for, to, to uh, another thing we have to think about is how to save money, um, how to make the government cost less, if possible. And I've already addressed regionalization. That's something that we need to continue to do. I support those efforts. Also, the closed landfill, turning that into a solar facility or energy park, as you've suggested, um, and others have suggested. I, suge I, I support all of those things. And again, also energy efficiencies, ESCO companies. I've supported those, and I'll continue to do that. And I'm open-minded to any sorts of new revenue forms that any, any of my constituents have. I'd love to hear it about any, at any point. Thank you. Um, President Reckman has asked that we try to be out of here by quarter of nine. So I'm going to ask one last question, and we'll go into final statement. Is that OK? Sure. Um, what do you feel will be the city's biggest challenge over the next two years, and how would you propose to tackle this issue? Who's first? I think Jesse is. Uh, again, I mean, the, 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 I believe the biggest issue is maintaining city services versus affordability. And the reason why I say versus is because it would be nice if they, if they didn't clash, but they certainly do. Um, so I'm extreme, extremely concerned about affordability. I'm concerned about people who, who live here, who grew up here, who can't afford to live here any, more, any longer. I'm concerned about people who have moved away and who would like to come back but can't. And I'm, I'm concerned also about commercial affordability and ensuring that our businesses um, stay here and that new ones come. So um, that's one challenge and also making government uh, more efficient. And I've already addressed some of, of those, uh, of some of the ways we can do that. So I'll, I'll see the rest of my time. The, um, actually, the one thing that will be an issue, that was an issue two years ago and four years ago, and is an issue tonight, <coughs> that we're making progress on is transparency and access to the municipal government. And to that end, we have been working very hard on that point. And still, there is work to be done. But that also requires participation from the public. And part of the frustration for me has been, while at the same time we expand transparency, we are not seeing a compensatory response from the community in some respect, which is where we need, we need we're all pulling the oars. We're all, it's not just, you know, elect me and have me fix the problems. It's, this is something that we experience collectively. It's just, and, and I think that is part of the ongoing challenge. And actually, to Jason's point and, and what Councillor Adams said, one of, one of my pie in the sky, which I hope is not pie in the sky revenue generation system, is a regional municipal broadband system. 
that I would love to see start, and we've already, we've, we're exploring the prospect of that, is establishing municipal broadband with a gig up and a gig down that they can get in Belarus and we can't get here. And that's because we've sanctioned monopolies with Comcast and they throttle it and charge you according to increased download speeds. We make it a municipal service. We get the revenue and we share it regionally with East Hampton, Holyoke, Amherst, and, and any other town that wants to sign in. Also gives us a little power and a little leverage with a corporation that's very wealthy that puts up a lot of resistance. But that actually then brings in and invites in new development technologies because access broad access to the internet is huge and that would offset some of the tax bumps that that discourages other uh, places from trying to move to areas that that you know otherwise might be appealing and we are enormously appealing we've discovered that and at the same time good give, provide good green, green jobs that pay well plus fill municipal coffers. So, did that 